Hello and welcome. My name is Dubs Weinblatt. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training for Metro New York for Keshet. I'm thrilled to be back as the co-host of season two of Joy and Resilience, Jewish LGBTQ leaders on what sustains us. This season, we are proud to partner with Bechol Lashon, an organization whose mission is to strengthen Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of Jewish identity and experience. I'm excited to introduce to you my co-host for the season, Anthony Russell. Hi, my name is Anthony Russell. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm a performer, composer, and writer of music, mostly in Yiddish, an essayist in a number of Jewish publications, a cultural advocate and activist, and last but not least, very pleased to be joining Dubs Weinblatt as co-host for season two of Joy and Resilience. As LGBTQ Jewish people, and specifically as Jews of color, oftentimes we need to create our own ways of persevering through tough moments. Surviving and thriving in this world has pushed us to create our own store of unique wisdom about resilience, joy, and community. Each episode, Dubs and I will invite a different LGBTQ Jew of color to join us in a thoughtful conversation about what sustains us and keeps us hopeful in a conversation where we can only speak from our own personal lived experiences. Born in Uzbekistan, raised in Seattle, and currently based in New York City, Ruben Shimanov is an educator, community builder, and social entrepreneur with a passion for Jewish diversity. He previously served as Director of Community Engagement and Education at Queens College Hillel. Currently, Ruben is the founding executive director of the Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network, an organization that is building a supportive and much-needed community for LGBTQ+, Sephardic, and Mizrahi Jews. He also serves as Vice President of Education and Community Engagement on the Young Leadership Board of the American Sephardi Federation, Director of Educational Experiences and Programming for the Muslim Jewish Solidarity Committee, and Director of the Sephardi House Fellowship, a new year-long learning and leadership development experience for college students. How do you have time to do this? (laughs) Welcome, Ruben. (laughs) Thank you, Dobbs. (laughs) So happy you're here. Thank you. It's so funny that you asked that, Dubs, because that's kind of a part of the question that I wanted to ask. Oh, um, great. <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, your work in education, social innovation, community building seems to come out of your experiences as someone at the intersection of Mizrahi, Sephardic, and Russian-speaking Jewish identities, which are, are ways of being Jewish that are perhaps to some degree unfamiliar to a majority of people raised in mainstream American Jewish culture and practice. So when you aren't busy doing this work of enriching and complicating American ideas of what it is to be Jewish, what kind of experiences connect you to joy? And are they in any way related to the intersection of your your identities? Thank you, first of all, again, Dubs and Anthony and uh, Keshet and um, Bechol Ashon for for having me here and for giving me the platform to share a little bit about uh, my story and my journey. Um, So regarding this this question, uh, it's from the way that I kind of interpret it, it's more uh, the question relates to my, the way that I spend my time and the way that I kind of obtain energy outside of my um, uh, community building work and and my work as an educator. And it's, it's actually really, you know, it's, it's tricky because a lot of what I do uh, professionally is so intertwined with just who I am and my, my being uh, for, you know, for better or I don't want to say worse, but for better or for uh, more complicated reasons, because that, that means that kind of that that boundary between work and life and that, that, that balance is a little bit more difficult. Um, but I actually think ultimately it's all for better because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it any other way. And so my, uh, my kind of initial way to answer that question is to actually go back to the things that are perhaps more in the professional realm, the ways in which I uh, <clears throat> engage, uh, engage folks, uh, my, my role as an educator, as a community organizer, um, because it's so, it, that really does give me life and, and joy. But if I, if I think a little bit more about the question, so that's kind of the, kind of the initial answer, uh, which again shows that <laughs> the lines between my uh, leadership and community and professional work and my personal life are, are quite blurred. 
um, which often happens when we are engaged in things that are we're deeply passionate about. On a, having said that, um, I definitely would say that uh, creative expression brings me a lot of uh, a lot of joy and a lot of um, healing. Uh, particularly um, my <clears throat> uh, my calligraphy work. I um, something that I think uh, wasn't because the bio was probably getting like too too, too long, <laughs> but something uh, that uh, um, wasn't mentioned yet was that I. Um, I do Arabic, Hebrew, and Persian calligraphy, and um, and use my connection to um, to language and my kind of my own background and the various chapters of my own journey, um, and combine and combine that also with a love for um, interfaith um, uh, interactions and encounters, and and kind of funnel that all of that through um, embellishing visually. Uh, the the written word, and um, and so that is something that uh, you know when I do that when I am kind of it's 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 when when I'm engaged in making calligraphy um, and juxtaposing these languages and seeing the ways in which they kind of might in surprisingly interact with one another when I'm doing that I'm very much at peace it's very meditative for me um, it's very grounding for me. Um, as someone who is often kind of has um, is a little bit all over the place and has as uh, my uh, as a friend once told me my, my hamster wheel just keeps on spinning for me something like calligraphy is a really powerful uh, way to kind of uh, settle you know kind of be grounded but again talking about that um, the, the blurred lines between the personal and the kind of communal and professional I have used very often in the past um, this passion as a community building and pedagogical educational tool, uh, whether engaging um, uh, different uh, Jewish communities or particularly within the Muslim Jewish uh, um, interfaith world. Just the other thing that I would say, another thing that uh, gives me a deep sense of, of that, of joy and comfort is, um, is my family, and I'm very, very grateful both for my uh, my chosen family, my friends, um, who really are. I think friends are the family that we choose, particularly for those of us um, in the LGBTQ plus world. Um, friends are often our only family, um, so I'm very, I'm very grateful for them. But and I'm also very grateful for my uh, for the family that. God, the universe, uh, 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 gifted me, um, and for the true love and um, unconditional love that uh, that they have shown me, and we have been through a lot, my family and I, as immigrants, as refugees, as um, uh, as a family that has faced loss, that has um, faced many trials and tribulations. It has only made us stronger, and so when I reflect upon this question. I'm truly grateful. I truly have this hakarat tov, this expression of gratitude to um, the loved, the, the, my, my loved ones in my life who have shown up for me and who continue to see me for exactly who I am. It's really beautiful, and I love, um, I love the phrase "friends are the family we choose." That's such a beautiful way to put that. Um, I'm really curious how you got into calligraphy in the first place. That sounds like such a powerful tool in your toolbox of joy. And I would love to know more about that. You know, I, growing up in a multilingual household um, as, an, um, as an immigrant, as someone from um, Central Asia, um, uh, as I, I, I might have said already, so I'm, I'm, uh, I was born in Uzbekistan, in a, which is a country in Central Asia, and I'm part of um, a very deep rooted Persian speaking Jewish community that has lived in that region of Central Asia, what is present day Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan. Uh, we have lived there for, um, for millennia, according to our narrative, since um, uh, the Babylonian um, expulsion. So um, many, many years. And, um, and through 
inhabiting uh, this region, which itself is actually yeah, not as well known. Forget about the Jewish part, just in general, uh, knowing where Uzbekistan is, I'm always pleasantly surprised when somebody knows that. Uh, but then the Jewish part is even more of a, uh, you know, more obscure and more of a mystery for, for many folks. Um, but having that background um, and, uh, w and, and with that background also holding the fact that our history in Central Asia was one of many different um, empires and conquests. And so as a minority community, we actually take a lot of pride in having lived through all of that. But a lot of those layers actually show up in our story. And so besides knowing uh, and, and kind of growing, uh, growing up with the Judeo-Persian dialect of my community of the Bukharian Jews, um, we, uh, most of us also, uh, most of us Bukharian Jews, Jews of Central Asia also speak Russian because of the Russian uh, colonial chapter and subsequent Soviet chapter. So that actually, Anthony, kind of going uh, to how you framed the first question when you were um, um, recognizing, and I appreciate that the kind of the, the crossroads of my identities in, in a way that's sometimes surprising to people being a Russian speaking Jew, a Soviet Jew, but also a Sephardic Mizrahi Jew, all of that is because of um, my, uh, my community's past in, in Central Asia. And so I bring that up because from, as I was saying, from a, from a young age, um, language and having multiple languages in a household was, was a reality. Um, Russian, Bukhari, which is our Judeo-Persian dialect, and also English um, and Hebrew as well, um, particularly through kind of liturgical, uh, via the liturgical means. Um, and, um, and also because a lot of our family ultimately ended up in Israel. Um, but also, you know, there are family members who knew Uzbek, even though that's not our distinct ethnic language, that's another language of the region. And so I was um, from a young age, very aware of the power of languages and the power of um, uh, of communicate of, of uh, communicating to people in a way that shows them their shows them respect, um, and I think understanding that the world is more than just an you know Anglo speaking world is one way uh, to do that. And for me, that was just you know, a natural product of, of growing up as an immigrant. And so that's the first thing I was holding was this was the, the power of language. And, and because I already had, you know, various languages in my in the household, uh, when I started then uh, learning, for example, Spanish in in high school, um, and at one and at a certain point, I then became highly proficient in it. It was it was just another like a natural next next step. My mind was already thinking in, in that kind of way. And I was very blessed because uh, to have that ability um, for a while, I actually, to be honest, was a bit, um, I was a bit ashamed, you know, because uh, most of my family members have uh, thick accents. Um, I remember I'm actually ashamed now to say that I was ashamed, but as a child, just trying to fit in, I remember I would, you know, not want my mom to speak too much in front of my friends because it would, um, out us as as immigrants and um, but with time I realized how powerful that is and what a what a blessing it is to to be an immigrant what a blessing it is to have a more global perspective what a blessing it is to know that there is a world beyond um, this um, this country that, that, that we live in <clears throat> and so all of that both kind of awareness but also the skills the, uh, the ways in which I was able to pick up languages um, made me uh, be constantly enamored with language. But then specifically in terms of Arabic, Hebrew, and Persian, how that came to be is, um, so Hebrew, I always had a connection to as, um, as another language of my people. Uh, my, my, the Persian language of my, of my community, that's the language of my people. But also um, in terms of the Jewish people, I deeply connect to Hebrew um, both classical and biblical Hebrew and Mishnaic and then and modern. I mean, there's there's a there's it's it, there's a lot of beauty in it, particularly if you already are looking at it through this more like a linguistic lens, which I was able to see uh, and appreciate it for. Um, and then Persian also was was uh, in the family, 
Um, and so Arabic for me was kind of like felt like a natural um, uh, kind of progression from Hebrew as a linguistic cousin language, um, but also as a language that has played an important role in my part of the world. Uzbekistan is part of, um, is a Muslim majority country. And while it's not part of the Arab, Arabic speaking world, um, by being uh, part of the kind of the, 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 the Muslim world, um, Uzbekistan is a place where um, Arabic is highly valued because just like in Judaism, where Hebrew is seen as a Lashona Kodesh, as a, as a holy tongue, Arabic in Islam is seen as a prophetic holy language um, in which the Quran was written. And so uh, for me, it wasn't just the connection between uh, an, a language near dear to me, which is Hebrew and kind of extending it from there. That was definitely one, one point of intersection. So when I started taking in college, I saw all those connections and they were beautiful, but it was actually a way for me to, again, continue acting upon and um, taking ownership of my Mizrahi identity, my identity of um, as a Jew from the, uh, from the Islamic world. Um, and, you know, I, remember there's so much incredible Islamic architecture in um, in Uzbekistan in cities like Bukhara and Samarkand and this you know these uh, mosques and mausoleums and madrasas schools um, they all have this you know beautiful calligraphy Arabic calligraphy from the Quran written on on the edifice and um, <clears throat> I'm sorry not the, on the facade of these of the buildings and so as I began to really connect to Arabic it actually allowed me to connect more to, to, to my region. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, as that relationship was forming, um, as I was studying um, uh, Arabic, both modern, like the, um, uh, uh, the kind of the mod modern standard Arabic, which is a more like formal register, and then some dialects, um, I would just doodle a lot. I, I, I was always doodling letters and, um, and then I just started doodling Hebrew and Arabic and, and, and Farsi together and seeing the ways in which particularly Hebrew and Arabic um, intersected, not just on a linguistic level, but again, on this theological level of being holy tongues. And so, uh, and I've continued to you to, to really um, lift up that, um, that parallel in uh, some of the work that I do in the interfaith uh, world, uh, really allowing people to see often for the first time, those beautiful connections between, uh, between these, these languages. I know I'm saying a lot and it's a, <laughs> a bit of a, you know, tangent, but, uh, but yeah, language is powerful and the way we speak it, the way we write it. Um, again, I think as Jews, we really, we really understand this, the, 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 the power of, um, of, 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 of communication of the tongue, both in terms, you know, in liturgy um, uh, as, as a written language, but also the whole idea of guarding our tongue and speaking intentionally. All of this for me, it, it, you know, is intertwined. And I think about it a lot when I am, let's say, meditating on, let, you know, putting on paper, let's say one Hebrew word and one Arabic word, maybe let's say, um, hub, in Arabic and Ahava in Hebrew and thinking, how am I going to kind of make them work together on a piece of paper and what story am I telling through that? It's interesting because in Judaism, <laughs> words always have the possibility of creating worlds. And as Dub said before, you're the founding director of the Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network which creates its own kind of world. It creates an essential space of supportive community for LGBTQ, Sephardic, and Mizrahi Jews. Now, of course, I love this because you've created a communal space for the two things we're trying to explore in the series, joy and resilience. So as someone who's made a space for those things, what does resilience mean for you? Mm, thank you, Anthony. I, I will actually reflect upon right now um, our, uh, this movement that we, that, that we created that I've had the blessing, the, the Beracha. Um, actually, it's uh, not coincidental to the coincidental that in Arabic, the word is Baraka. So the Beracha, the Baraka of, of leading. Uh, I, I want to reflect upon SMQ and the Spartak Mizrahi Network as I, as I talk about 
um, uh, resilience and what it means to me. So the Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network was born out of a sense of urgency. It was born out of an understanding, a realization that those of us at the crossroads, at the intersection of LGBTQ plus and Sephardic and Mizrahi identities needed a, a platform, needed a supportive, vibrant space for us to be our full selves. It was born out of a realization that such a space has not yet existed. And that because of this, those of us who hold these different identities have, have been constantly compartmentalizing our selves and our experiences and always checking something at the door. And many of us got, actually kind of got good at that, but that is exhausting. And that is, I could be paralyzing um, and, and draining. And so SMQN emerged um, as, a, as, a, as a reaction to that and as a conscious uh, attempt at uh, creating this much needed uh, community where we can bring, as I said, all parts of who we are, all the layers of our, of our identities um, and where we didn't have to check anything in the door and where we can, um, in community, learn more about each other and ourselves um, without unapolog un un unapologetically, right? And, and do that work unapologetically. And I think when you create, um, when one creates something that they know is um, addressing a certain social gap, when one creates in community with others, something that is very much needed, uh, that is, um, it's created out of a sense of urgency. As you're doing that, it is, it can be scary work, it is difficult work, but it is also very empowering work. And it is work that makes you feel, or let, I'll just say like for me, for example, um, it has made me feel resilient. It has made me feel that I can, through, through creative thinking and through, through innovation and through partnerships with other uh, like-minded individuals who also have, who are driven by uh, a desire to see tomorrow be better than today. For, 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 for those of us, like for those of us in that kind of endeavor, um, we are we are, we are then uh, provided a lot of hope and a lot of, um, a lot of strength and, and resilience. And so I would say that, you know, what gives me through the lens of SMQN, what kind of has given me that the ability to, um, bounce back, get back up. And Lord knows I've need, I've done that a lot because resilience doesn't mean that you're, you know, in my, in my mind, it doesn't mean that you're always strong. It doesn't mean that you show up every day facing the world. Like, yeah, at least for me, that is not the case. So no, I have moments of extreme vulnerability of anxiety, of, of depression, of concern, um, of self doubt, um, of pain that I hold some pain, either that I have almost kind of brought upon myself or often pain that I am holding from, um, the world around me and from, um, societies around me and, 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 and burdens that have been put upon me. So I, I am, I am very, you know, we are all very human in that way. And so for me to be a resilient person, it's, you know, it, it's almost, it's like, it's essentially it really, it's, it's related in my mind to, you know, this expression, I think it goes something like, you know, the, 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 the strength of a person isn't marked by, um, you know, what they're, uh, um, what they're given, but by how they are, re how they um, kind of 
respond to it, right? What, what they're able to, uh, to do that because we're often, you know, life is unfair and, and uh, disadvantage and marginalization and disempowerment exists. And, and, and we are often not in control of the hand of the deck of cards that we are dealt. But I think a mark of resilience and strength is how do we move forward with with uh, some of those struggles and some of those uh, uh, challenges. And for me, when I am able to, again, use my creativity, when I'm able to dream big um, and, um, and do that in concert with, in collaboration with others, and when I'm able to um, envision a future that is moving the needle forward and, and working towards that, that gives me uh, uh, resilience because that reminds me that no matter what may be happening around me, what nobody can take away from me is my head and my heart, right? Which is again, a very Jewish thing. Um, our, our, uh, you know, our, our, our heart, our, our, our soul, our mind. Um, and there are moments when I really need to remind myself that, that that creative energy that I have, whether it's again, through calligraphy, like we spoke about, whether it's through community building and organizing, whether it's through the way that I show up as an educator or just the way I show up as a, you know, as a friend, as, as, a, as a son, uh, as a global citizen, um, it's, all, it's all kind of um, fueled by my head, my heart, and my, and my soul. And reminding myself that in particularly difficult moments where um, I might feel really tired and really despondent, that is what gives me uh, resilience. And that is very much, I would say, a, a crucial message of, of the Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network is, uh, is the value of um, being able to creatively uh, build a, a, a community on our own terms and, and to be able to take ownership of that experience, take ownership of our Jewish identity, of our queer identity, of our Mizrahi Sephardi identity, and know that uh, you have the kind of the support system uh, to do that. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I feel inspired just by the work that you're doing and, and hearing you talk about it. This season of Join Resilience is specifically about the experiences of queer Jews of color. And as somebody who educates and advocates on behalf of your cultures, has there been a particular moment or an experience you've had where you were able to fully inhabit your different identities all at once? And if so, like, what did that moment look like? Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I would say maybe less so of um, of one moment, but but a certain kind of episode that made made me feel, and I would say made. Um, yeah, me and, and, and many members in my community feel that um, we are really not only able to hold uh, uh, multiple parts of our identities, but that we are seen for who we are. I would say uh, an important uh, kind of uh, turning point for us with that was um, the, um, uh, the partnership that we established with JCC Harlem and uh, the UGA, the, the, uh, the Jewish Federation, UGA Federation of New York, um, a, a like the mothership of um, uh, support for both uh, um, Jewish communities and Jewish so social services, but also beyond. Uh, they do a lot of um, important social services work and advocacy uh, for, for different communities, both in New York and, and, and globally as well. When we were able to um, create this partnership uh, between a foundation that I, you know, I really respect, um, that does important work and really embodies, I think, the Jewish values of chesed, of loving kindness, of 
die kun olam of of helping uh, repair the brokenness in the world, um, and then also connecting that with JCC Harlem, a um, a, a Harlem based Jewish community center, both serving. Uh, that kind of emerging Jewish community in in the area, but again, also being a space for just the Harlem community, um, and a space that also is very dedicated to social justice and um, and inclusivity. When we were able to to have that kind of partnership for be, be, be formed, which was not it was a very active thing, and I'm and and it, it, and I'm proud of the work that SNQ and to JC Harlem and UJ, all of us to do this. When we did that, it was very affirming, I want to say. It was, uh, look, we knew SMQN, uh, we know that what we are doing is, um, is important and that it is a, you know, a lifeline for, for many people and that we are addressing uh, uh, a, a, an, an important ga critical gap in the, in, the, in the Jewish world. And I would also say in the LGBTQ world and the crossroads of those. Um, so we know that we, we have uh, uh, we know that what we're doing is um, is important and that it is compelling and impactful. But to kind of have that be seen and I don't even want to say validated validated, but kind of like yeah affirmed by um, kind of these bigger organizations, right? That um, uh, or in the case of UJA, bigger. In the case of JC Harlem, just uh, a bit more established because they are, you know, small and mighty in their own way, but they are also connected to JCC of Manhattan. So to have that partnership, it made us, it made us realize, it made me realize that much more so that, you know, the Jewish world sees us, and they they believe in what we're doing, not just in a, you know, in. Um, in words, but this time in action, in deeds, right? In grants, in support, um, in uh, providing space, in, uh, in asking us what we need, in also inviting us to the table to pull, uh, uh, move the needle forward of how they think about equity, inclusivity, and, and, and diversity, right? And, and so that moment, which happened almost two years ago now when, when, when that partnership began, was a really powerful moment because it, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it kind of proved uh, once again uh, to us that this is important. And it, you know, I want to give this message as to whoever will be watching this, that those, that kind of um, recognition that manifests in monetary support and in institutional support, that matters a lot. And when we, when those, when those of us who are, you know, have kind of been clawing our way a little bit to create more of a spotlight or a platform for our stories, uh, when we are, um, when we receive that kind of recognition, and when we are seen as real like partners at the table, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable, and ultimately. It also, at the end of the day, and I, and I know, you know, those of us here on this call, we, we, I'm sure we can agree, with, it's, it doesn't just benefit these particular, as I call, tiles of the mosaic that maybe have been more on the margins of the masterpiece, but it actually enriches the entire mosaic because the work that we're doing, this is a chapter in the Jewish people novel. And so when, when our stories and, and, you know, insert into this other intersectional Jewish experiences that have been sidelined, when those stories and experiences are given um, a platform, are, are, are given the tools to thrive and succeed and the resources, we all benefit. The Jewish world benefits. And so um, the other reason why I was... Uh, you know, as I said, it was both kind of, it was affirming and empowering to us to know, oh, you know, kind of the bigger wigs um, not only believe in us, but, but want us at the table. So that was, that warmed my heart, but also warmed my heart was now we can inform our sisters, brothers, and siblings in the Jewish world. Now we can be, uh, we have an opportunity to be teachers as well, and we can enrich uh, the lives of our 
global Jewish family. And so it was a, it's been very symbiotic, um, this, um, uh, this partnership and uh, something that, again, I'm, 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 I'm still with so much gratitude. I think this is really interesting because this is a this is a question we've asked all of our guests, and usually their expression of it is very personal, which is great. But it, what's really interesting to hear you talk about this is to realize that there's actually an institutional way in which one could also have this experience, and that's also very profound. Um, so I really appreciate you like your answer because it's it's been so different. Um, but also very important. So here's a question I've been dying to ask you. <laughs> As a queer person myself working specifically in culture, I can't tell you how many times I've encountered other queer people who take on the responsibility of learning and retaining, teaching and innovating on the traditions and the folkways of their own cultures, in spite of the fact that queerness and traditional culture are oftentimes looking at, uh, looked at as things are, that are in like opposition to each other. Um, and I'm curious if you had this experience in, in your own work of, of being a, a queer person who, mm. who you know, learns, retains, teaches mm. and innovates on, on tradition. And like, what does that look like? I love it, Anthony. Uh, that's, I love that question. And it's so, I just, it's so, I, I often don't hear it phrased like that. Uh, and it's so spot on. And it, it so speaks actually the language again of both my personal experiences and this community that I um, uh, help lead. I, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm always striking a balance. I feel like with these questions between kind of answering through, you know, it's all through my own perspective, but you know, it, it just, it feels just always very natural to bring, to bring in SMQN because that's been my extended family. And because my work there is very much informed by, you know, things that I've needed, like I'm gonna call it out what it is. Like I've needed a space like this. Right. So it's all kind of, again, intertwined back to what I was saying in the beginning. Um, but I appreciate that question because it's actually, um, I'll again, kind of answer it both from my, uh, my own uh, uh, journey as a, uh, a Bukharian, uh, Mizrahi Sparta queer Jew, but also I'll kind of connect it to um, SMQN. We engage with this question all the time uh, because it is, it just shows up um, in our, in our lives all the time as folks who hold, who are holding, you know, um, uh, LGBTQ plus and Persian identity, LGBTQ plus and Syrian and Iraqi and Bukharian and Yemenite identities. And I also feel like um, in that way, actually, another, you know, our experiences as Mizrahi queer Jews also intersect with um, queer folks from other immigrant communities, particularly from our region. And actually something that I hope, uh, you know, I always like to put some, you know, new um, things into the universe that uh, I can then work towards with my community. And, um, and as someone who is very much kind of in this world of, social entrepreneurship and innovation, I'm always thinking about that. So what I'm about to say is that I, I also feel that um, our experiences of Mizrahi and queer Jews, which connect to those of um, queer Muslims, uh, queer Arabs, um, who can be Muslim, Christian, or, or, or Jewish identified, um, and other, um, just other uh, 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 queer folks from, I would say, particularly uh, communities in Africa and Asia, um, which is a huge chunk of the world, but we have, th there is uh, an important intersectional point, and I actually hope that um, in the coming year, one objective that I have is that we, SMQN, does more work um, in, in kind of um, a coalition with and solidarity with our queer siblings who come from, from other traditional um, it's a you know kind of a loaded word, but traditional uh, communities because what we all share as distinct and and, and unique as we all are, uh, because even let's say a word like Mizrahi or Sephardi, even within let's say the Jewish realm, right? That umbrella encapsulates, I mean, folks from Morocco to Afghanistan, right? So like, how, so the, holding that inherent internal diversity, um, I think what connects us. Um, both again as in our SMQN community, but also what connects me so much to my, you know, dear queer immigrant friends from from other uh, faith backgrounds, is this 
uh, constant uh, juggling act or negotiation or um, uh, at times tension, at other times just a simultaneous holding of our, um, you know, of, of uh, our heritage of values from our traditions and our culture and also another salient part of identity are LGBTQ plus identities. And so we're always not not, but ma many of us. Uh, for example, I'm 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 constantly uh, engaged in this conversation, and it's something that shows up a lot in our uh, in our community. Because as I said, you know, we have folks from the Persian Jewish community, Syrian, Moroccan, uh, Yemenite, and so on and so forth. And all of these communities um, have hold a lot of. Um, weight and 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 uh take our pride in the deep roots of of their stories and at the same time anthony as you said what can at times be the case is that there is um um uh, there there are just sometimes challenges in in holding that reality uh with uh the fact that uh, that, that we are queer. And by challenges, I don't mean that we are necessarily, let's say for me, that I'm having an identity, an identity crisis of Kenepi Buhari and, and, and queer. No, I am both. I am both elu ve elu, this and this. But the challenges come from the fact that, you know, in, um, in you know, some of our communities, as with other communities also, homophobia is still there. Transphobia might still be there. Um, you know, uh, limiting gender roles, you know, might, st uh, uh, might still be there. But what, um, but what we do at SMQN and what has become, been very liberating and, and resilient for us is kind of to bring that all to the table and to create a space where nobody is, tells us what we should choose or not choose, right? This I think often happens, particularly I can speak more um, uh, in, in like in, um, with, with uh, in, in immigrant, uh, with, with uh, uh, queer immigrant folks where, you know, for, uh, you, will, you will have people who will say, well, you know, particularly people outside of the community who will say, well, you know, if your family or if your community doesn't fully accept you, like, you know, they should like, take it or leave it, right? So, so, you know, just do your own thing and do you. And that's actually a very narrow way of looking at it that I think is often a kind of an American way. Not to say I think the individualism of a lot of American culture is actually, it is powerful, right? That you are your own person and that gives you agency. But sometimes what do we lose when we gain that? And I think what we lose at times, and this is something, you know, again, when I speak to my friends from official immigrant backgrounds, they, they're like, they're with me on that. What often is lost then is, um, you know, responsibility and devotion to others and, and thinking outside of just your own world um, and uh, understanding what we owe to each other and um, the love and uh, I would say the commitment that uh, family can, can, you know, can have and, and, and community, especially again, immigrant communities where, you know, we're kind of like all we have when, when, when we first come to this country. And so when somebody says, you know, well, if they, you know, if your grandparents don't fully accept you, then just like shut them out. I understand it's coming from a place of love, but that's not necessarily, you know, what I, uh, uh, what I want to hear. And at the same time, when we are in our communities, we are sometimes hearing things that are not in line with, uh, our values um, as in, you know, that let's say again for me that I have, uh, that I have as a progressive um, uh, person who is uh, very much not just fighting for the liberation of the, the identities that I'm part of, but, but um, um, of other disenfranchised communities. And so ultimately, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there is no, uh, there's no clear cut cookie cutter answer to this, but what, what does exist is the reality of um, people like me uh, who are just holding that complexity, who understand some of those challenges and who are leaning into them and who are doing the work themselves to, um, to kind of not only balance their own, you know, uh, 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 
whole simultaneously all these parts of their identities, but are doing the, you know, the hard work of uh, engaging their uh, traditional communities in some of these conversations and engaging some of their queer, let's say, queer white American folks in what is a uh, 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 cultural diversity of the LGBT world, right? And the place that tradition might have in that. Um, I think we are, you know, we're just continuing to understand what that looks like for us. Uh, and ultimately, no one should be there to tell us that, you know, you know, you, 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 how can, you can't hold both of these things. Well, who are you to say that? Let us kind of decide how um, how we do that. And the final thing that I will say is that they're actually, when we do this kind of work, um, we, for me, I have, um, what has been illuminated to me are the ways that, um, not only the ways in which I can hold both, you know, different parts of my identities, but the ways in which certain parts of my culture actually positively inform my LGBT uh, identity, um, whether it is through, um, you know, various texts that I have uh, learned um, coming from the, um, the, the the greater Sephardic Mizrahi world um, that speak to kind of the, um, the flexibility, the openness of them, the, the balanced approach that actually very much is the classic Sephardi approach to, uh, to, to life, an approach where uh, a person can be very, you know, very much, you know, in the up in the clouds, but also um, pursue the sciences and pursue logic and 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 pursue, um, you know, the uh, worldly disciplines. Um, also, the, um, um, the again the, the the values of my culture that emphasize. Um, commitment to your loved ones above all else. Um, or even something as, this might be kind of silly, but something as, uh, uh, to me, as beautiful as the attire that we have. Um, maybe this is my own, I'm kind of projecting into it. But for example, in my community, we have a lot of very, very colorful uh, clothing, bright, bright colors in our traditional uh, garments, in our robes, in our kipot, bright pinks and, and, and light greens and yellows and purples. And, um, and these are not associated with a particular gender. You know, we have sometimes, I think, more in the American world, this kind of gendered view of, of colors in this. And, um, and through attire, through fashion, through that, I actually feel... Um, like I have, I have a space in that. And so I bring that into, um, into my LGBT work actually. So yeah, that's kind of going rambling on and on, but, uh, Ruben, I am literally the last person who is going to, uh, consider, uh, <laughs> fashion or attire to be silly, man. That's like, <laughs> I, I take that very seriously. It's just another form of self-expression of kind of establishment of who you are in space. So the fact that you're able to find continuities between your queerness and that, that aspect, that kind of traditional aspect of your culture is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And also just what, another final thing I'll say is, and I, I'm going to actually have, if you give me three seconds, yes. This one actually, the luster has kind of, I accidentally uh, washed it when I should not have. This is handmade and the luster of it and the brightness has gone away. But these kipot, these beautiful kipot that we have in our, uh, in our community, they're very much a reflection of our, of the many, many years we, sent, we spent in Central Asia um, in um, living next to our Muslim neighbors and, and the ways in which kind of there were those, you know, cultural um, exchanges, right? It's reflected in, in, in this kind of clothing. These kind of kipot, by the way, I should, I should mention, I have old photos of my great, uh, uh, of, of like my great grandparents generation. And it was not just worn, this was worn by, by multiple genders. So this was not just worn by men. I have my great grandmother, my great, great aunt would wear uh, these kipot as well. And so again, for me, maybe this is, and then, you know, the floral patterns inside we were talking about, that. maybe again, this is me um, making meaning of it in my own way. And I'm, and, and, and I'm okay with it. I actually, again, going back to what I was saying, the power of creativity for us to kind of reclaim our cultures is, is important. But for me, when I would see that, it was actually really cool because um, 
it again, it challenged some things because, you know, in the American context, we often, you know, people would say, well, no, in traditional Jewish societies, men were kippot, and this is only with the reform movement uh, did it extend to other genders. Well, that's not the case with, with my Bukharian family, right? And so, um, so I appreciate Anthony what you said, yeah, because attire is actually it's 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 deeper. It's a reflection of um, the, the the tapestry that a community has weaved across time and space. So, yeah. <laughs> Just for our listeners, I want I, I want them to know that uh, <laughs> Ruben was showing us a really beautiful kind of polychrome Bukharian kippa, kind of with these beautiful sort of floral shapes all over it, like on on a white ground. So. Mm. So that's what that's what he was describing. Um, that was me in my my faux curatorial mode. Love there. it, thank you, <laughs> beautiful job. So and Anthony, and it, actually, I'm sorry. Just one yeah. other thing I want to say right now. When you know we've been um, an important theme, um, uh, what has emerged kind of organically as an uh, as a theme in our conversation from the first question as we move forward is um, you know the power of. Uh, again, of words, of, of what we say and how we say it. And so one thing I just want to mention is I don't want to take for granted. I, want, I don't want to assume that all the listeners might know this, uh, or maybe folks have heard these terms, but um, want more of kind of a, a deeper understanding of it is, are the wor- these two identity words that I've been throwing out a lot, Sephardic, Sephardi, and Mizrahi, or Mizrahi, um, um, Kind of in, in, in English. And I actually give, you know, whole sessions about these terms and their complexity, which is far beyond our conversation. But I, um, I want to just uh, uh, speak a little bit about them in, um, uh, within the context or, or kind of actually connecting it to another word that is important for, the, for, the, for this uh, series, which is uh, JOC, Jews of Color and People of Color. And what I want to say um, you know, first and foremost is uh, when I use Sephardic and Mizrahi, and I actually intentionally combine them, I am uh, uh, referring to uh, uh, Jews and uh, and Jewish communities um, with roots in um, actually a very wide, a very expansive uh, part of of the world, uh, but uh, but essentially uh, Jewish communities that have, for um, the bulk of their history, uh, lived. Um, alongside their um, again their their Muslim uh, uh, neighbors and and within the back, within uh, a Muslim social um, and cultural context, um, there is there are other things that kind of connect uh, this world and I would say actually uh, Sephardic um, thought and um, and philosophy that is you know spans from. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula from Spain through North Africa and the Middle East, that kind of intellectual connection is one that that connected uh, uh, this world. Um, but there's also a lot that doesn't, because again, we're putting under one umbrella Jews from North Africa, from the Middle East slash West Asia and Central Asia. Uh, and so it is kind of easy to say, OK, well, it's non, you know, non-European Jews. And, and so it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's identifying it against, like, within what it isn't, but that can be uh, problematic. At the same time, um, it, it does expose the reality that many of these stories um, have been on the margins, and so there, that is another kind of thread that connects us. What doesn't connect us is we're not necessarily Jews of Arab lands, right? Some Mizrahim are, others are not. Um, and... Um, but again, these these terms they they mean different things to different people at different times. They are dynamic. Uh, they are um, uh, they change with time. They are fluid. Some people say I connect with Sephardi, and and Mizrahi is a term that was actually an Orientalist term established by the Ashkenazi establishment in the early years of the state of Israel. It's not for me. Others will say no, I'm Mizrahi because. I'm not from Spain and I maybe don't subscribe to the idea of a kind of a Sephardic um, intellectual uh, diaspora. I am east of the land of Israel, Mizrach, and my roots are 25, 2600 years old. And, and, and that Easternness was only, um, uh, what's it called, reiterated through some of the racism or xenophobia that I felt. I am Mizrahi, I'm not Ashkenazi, I'm not Sephardi, I am my own. So, I combine them to kind of honor 
uh, that complexity because historically, really, the kind of, again, f um, intertwining of Sephardi and Mizrahi is, is a lot more beautifully complicated. And just to end, the way that I would connect it to um, uh, the, the term JOC, Jews of Color, is that um, I, I was actually uh, on, a, on a call yesterday uh, with the Jewish Federation. It was the third uh, JOC uh, uh, gathering for professionals, for Jewish professionals, um, and uh, Yoshi of Mitsui Collective and um, uh, uh, Isaiah Rothstein are the um, are, are uh, kind of we're holding the space for us um, among others, and I apologize if there are also the Jews of Color Initiative is is so there's some really wonderful thinkers there, and we spoke a lot about how you know this term can, um, as with all identity terms, is fluid and ever changing, and not only means different things for different people but might mean different things at different, uh, at different times and can both be empowering, uh, but also can be, can be flattening, right? Because it puts under one big umbrella um, the experiences of, um, of East Asians, of, of Black Jews, of um, uh, Mizrahi Jews, which could be its own umbrella. And even that connection to Jews of color is, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. But ultimately, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, going back to the power of words, it all depends on, you know, yeah, how we make meaning of it, how we use them and what, um, you know, what, what how, how it resonates with, with, with each of us. Any identity term, even something like queer, right, can be both a way to uh, bring us together, to build coalitions, to organize, to support one another, to stand in solidarity. And it could also be potentially flattening. I think the power in those terms, and this is also where the power of JOC comes in. And, and, and again, I wanna cite my, my teachers in this, uh, Yoshi and, um, and Isaiah, the power in those terms is holding the fact that they can be a little bit flattening like Mizrahi, but understanding that what rises up, like uh, what, what, what is more important, like what um, uh, its urgency and importance come fr comes from its ability to have us build coalitions, support one another, and, um, and raise awareness about experiences, about stories, about struggles that maybe have otherwise been, um, you know, are, are relegated to the margins. Sorry for that uh, footnote, but it's, it was important, I think. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yes, thank you so much for that footnote. It was important and really illuminating. Um, and yes, Anthony, I saw you come off mute too. Yeah, so it's been really interesting talking to you and kind of experiencing how, you know, these various parts of who you are arranged across kind of the ways in which you serve uh, your various communities. I want to ask a last question. And I, I want this question, if, if, I could, <laughs> if I could be so bold, to, to really... Um, to really come from like from you and not necessarily from the varied amounts of responsibilities and um, amazing contributions that you give to all of, of your constituent communities. Like what gives you hope? What is something you see that makes you feel hopeful or something that you think about? Okay, what gives me hope? And this is literally the first thing that came to mind. For better or worse, I actually didn't, uh, um, I think, misplaced the questions that you had. So all this is actually very, like, from the lev, from my heart, from my, from my neshama, from my soul coming to you here. So apologies if sometimes it's not as eloquent, but I'm really processing it processing this in real time. And I just want to thank you again, Anthony and Dubs for creating this, uh, a space where I feel uh, really held in doing that. I, I really want to thank you. And just in general, thank you for this endeavor. Uh, if I haven't said that before, it's so awesome. And I'm so freaking excited to just, to hear, uh, uh, to see kind of the final uh, edit of all of this and to, uh, to listen as, as someone interested as a student myself probably won't be listening to my own interview because I hate my own voice. All right, so in terms of hope, ikva, omid, as we say in, uh, in Persian, what gives me 
hope is forgiveness. And when you were asking me, when you were asking this question, that word just came into my mind and it just popped in there. And then I, for a second, just to be honest with you, I thought, okay, wait a minute. Is that really what I want to say right now? Are there other things that give me hope? And then I said, no, wait a minute, let me go with this. It came to me. I feel it. And let me figure out why that's the case. So I will be figuring that out as I'm speaking to you right now. I think forgiveness is it's such a powerful nida, as we say in Hebrew, such a powerful attribute. It's such an important, um, I would say, skill actually to acquire. Because sometimes attribute makes it sound like, you know, we're born with something, but no, we can, we can work on that. We can, we can flex that muscle because it's hard. It's hard to forgive ourselves. It is hard to remove shame and frustration we have towards ourselves and towards things we wish we did or could have, would have, should have done. Um, it could be very challenging to forgive others who we think have hurt us, who have made us feel small or, or invisible. It is hard to sometimes forgive just a cruel world. I know, and, and, the, and the kind of the world can be, you know, I'm a very sensitive person. And so I'm often, I'm often really kind of exhausted by like one thing that is really sitting with me so heavy, so, so heavy these days is gun violence in the US. And as we talk about the, the, the epidemic of the pandemic of COVID, I think about this other, I don't actually do it an epidemic and pandemic. I use them kind of, but this other pandemic that um, is just I can't get I can't get used to it. And so I am often you know at times I'm kind of you know upset with an kind of an unforgiving world. So so far I've said all the ways that it's difficult and how you know it is. Um, uh, it's a struggle, but the reason why it's a source of hope for me is because I continue seeing around me and I hope for, and I pray for even more of this. I continue seeing around me um, acts of forgiveness, acts of forgiveness of, you know, my loved ones, people around me or, or myself, um, Forgiving others. Another thing that's very kind of, I mean, we're getting personal here, but it's like heavy on my heart right now is my estranged father who lives in Uzbekistan. Um, uh, there are some Jews who still live there. Uh, it's a very small community, but uh, whom I haven't seen in, in um, well over, I would say like 15 years, well over a decade, um, who I actually learned recently had a stroke and is doing is not doing well. I... I have forgiven him for not being present in my life, even though that has been a source of a lot of pain for me. And I have seen my dear friends forgive me for moments and for times in which I have not been my best. And I have seen through like truth and reconciliation and through restorative justice, I've seen examples of forgiveness. Not, not, you know, like the difficult work of forgiveness. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's part of also, it's connected to, like I would say, like kapara, like atonement, all of these things. It's actually, again, very Jewish. We, we have these concepts. And, and in, in our, in our uh, um, thinking, from what I gather, it's not like you say one thing and you're forgiven. No, it's work. It's work. Teshuvah, repentance, returning is work. And it requires, you know, work from both sides. And, 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 but also in that work of forgiveness, of repentance, of, of atonement. Um, the other thing that I've seen a lot, um, and, and I always pray that there will be more of that, is forgiveness, us forgiving ourselves. 
And I actually think that's also in my mind, in my way of looking at, again, like Yom Kippur and, uh, you know, atoning for our sins, all of this stuff. I, uh, I, well, it's not just about you and your fellow human. It's not just between you and, you know, the divine in, in a kind of a traditional way. Uh, those are kind of the two important relationships, but also the forgiveness between you and you, you and yourself. And I think about that a lot uh, uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um, and, and use that time to, to do that work as well, because some of the biggest forgiving that I think we have to do, um, particularly those of us who have, um, you know, suffered at the hands of different like systems of oppression, whether that is racism, whether that's xenophobia, whether that's homophobia, whether it's transphobia, um, anti-Semitism sexism, patriarchy, misogyny. Um, we, many of us, uh, me, I have a kind of at, at various times said, you know, is it me, right? I might be, I'm probably the problem. And I talk actually a lot about this in, as a way of kind of, I guess, acting on or, or showing kind of vulnerable leadership. It's, I think it's important um, because those self-doubts, that insecurity, that shame is still there. And it's a reflection of, um, you know, bigotry that is still in the world that we kind of almost internalize. And so forgiving ourselves is something very, very powerful and um, something that we can always do more of, but that I've seen around me, something that I've been practicing more. And so that gives me tikva, that gives me hope. I think with forgiveness among other uh, 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 approaches. It's not the only one, but a lot of healing, a lot of personal, uh, familial, communal, and global healing can happen. Can you hear our song? That should happen. It's very beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruben, for sharing um, so many different parts of you and personally and professionally and um, how they are so connected as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us and for sharing. Thank you, Dobbs. Thank you, Anthony, again. Thank you, Keshet. Thank you, Behol Ashon. Um, thank you, world. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Joy and Resilience. To learn more about Keshet, a national organization that works for the full equality of all LGBTQ Jews and their families in Jewish life, you can visit them at www.keshetonline.org. And to learn more about Bechol Lashon, an organization that strengthens Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of Jewish identity and experience, please visit them at globaljews.org.